Apartheid, Wikipedia article audio. Apartheid, lit. Separateness was a system of institutionalized racial segregation and discrimination that existed in South Africa between 1948 and 1994. The system was based on white supremacy and the repression of the black majority of the population for the benefit of the politically and economically dominant group, Afrikaners, and other whites. Despite the end of official legislation in 1991, Apartheid laws remained in effect and black South Africans still had no representation in government. Broadly speaking, apartheid was delineated into petty apartheid, which entailed the segregation of public facilities and social events, and grand apartheid, which dictated housing and employment opportunities by race. Prior to the 1940s, some aspects of apartheid had already emerged in the form of minority rule by white South Africans and the socially enforced separation of black South Africans from other races, which later extended to pass laws and land apportionment. Apartheid was adopted as a formal policy by the South African government after the ascension of the National Party during the country's 1948 general elections. Etymology Precursors A codified system of racial stratification began to take form in South Africa under the Dutch Empire in the late 18th century, although informal segregation was present much earlier due to social cleavages between Dutch colonists and a Creolizid, ethnically diverse slave population. With the rapid growth and industrialization of the British Cape Colony in the 19th century, racial policies and laws became increasingly rigid. Cape legislation that discriminated specifically against black Africans began appearing shortly before 1900. The policies of the Boer republics were also racially exclusive, for instance, the Transvaal Constitution barred non-white participation in church and state. The first apartheid law was the Prohibition of Mixed Marriages Act, 1949, followed closely by the Immorality Act of 1950, which made it illegal for most South African citizens to marry or pursue sexual relationships across racial lines. The Population Registration Act 1950 classified all South Africans into one of four racial groups based on appearance, known ancestry, socioeconomic status, and cultural lifestyle black, white, colored, and Indian, the last two of which included several sub classifications. Places of residence were determined by racial classification. From 1960 to 1983, 3.5 million non-white South Africans were removed from their homes and forced into segregated neighborhoods, in one of the largest mass removals in modern history. Most of these targeted removals were intended to restrict the black population to 10 designated tribal homelands, also known as Bantu stands, four of which became nominally independent states. The government announced that relocated persons would lose their South African citizenship as they were absorbed into the Bantu stands. Apartheid sparked significant international and domestic opposition, resulting in some of the most influential global social movements of the 20th century. It was the target of frequent condemnation in the United Nations and brought about an extensive arms and trade embargo on South Africa. During the 1970s and 1980s, internal resistance to apartheid became increasingly militant, prompting brutal crackdowns by the National Party administration and protracted sectarian violence that left thousands dead or in detention. Some reforms of the apartheid system were undertaken, including allowing for Indian and colored political representation in parliament but these measures failed to appease most activist groups. <laughs>
Between 1987 and 1993 the National Party entered into bilateral negotiations with the African National Congress, the leading anti-apartheid political movement, for ending segregation and introducing majority rule. In 1990, prominent ANC leaders such as Nelson Mandela were released from detention. Apartheid legislation was abolished in mid-1991 pending multiracial elections set for April 1994. Apartheid is an Afrikaans word meaning separateness, or the state of being apart, literally aparthood. Its first recorded use was in 1929. Institution under the 1806 Cape Articles of Capitulation the new British colonial rulers were required to respect previous legislation enacted under Roman Dutch law and this led to a separation of the law in South Africa from English common law and a high degree of legislative autonomy. The governors and assemblies that governed the legal process in the various colonies of South Africa were launched on a different and independent legislative path from the rest of the British Empire. In the days of slavery, slaves required passes to travel away from their masters. In 1797 the Landdrost and Heemraten of Swellendam and Grafrenet extended pass laws beyond slaves and ordained that all Khoikhoi moving about the country for any purpose should carry passes. This was confirmed by the British colonial government in 1809 by the Hottentot Proclamation, which decreed that if a Khoikhoi were to move they would need a pass from their master or a local official. Ordinance No. 49 of 1828 decreed that prospective black immigrants were to be granted passes for the sole purpose of seeking work. These passes were to be issued for coloreds and Khoikhoi, but not for other Africans, who were still forced to carry passes. Election of 1948 the United Kingdom Slavery Abolition Act 1833 abolished slavery throughout the British Empire and overrode the Cape Articles of Capitulation. To comply with the Act the South African legislation was expanded to include Ordinance 1 in 1835, which effectively changed the status of slaves to indentured labourers. This was followed by Ordinance 3 in 1848, which introduced an indenture system for COSA that was little different from slavery. The various South African colonies passed legislation throughout the rest of the 19th century to limit the freedom of unskilled workers, to increase the restrictions on indentured workers and to regulate the relations between the races. The Franchise and Ballot Act of 1892 instituted limits based on financial means and education to the black franchise, and the Natal Legislative Assembly Bill of 1894 deprived Indians of the right to vote. The Glenn Gray Act of 1894 instigated by the government of Prime Minister Cecil John Rhodes limited the amount of land Africans could hold. In 1905 the General Pass Regulations Act denied blacks the vote, limited them to fixed areas and inaugurated the infamous pass system. The Asiatic Registration Act required all Indians to register and carry passes. In 1910, the Union of South Africa was created as a self-governing dominion, which continued the legislative program, the South Africa Act enfranchised whites, giving them complete political control over all other racial groups while removing the right of blacks to sit in parliament, the Native Land Act prevented blacks, except those in the Cape, from buying land outside reserves. The Natives in Urban Areas Bill was designed to force blacks into locations, the Urban Areas Act introduced. Residential segregation and provided cheap labor for industry led by white people, the Color Bar Act prevented black mine workers from practicing skilled trades, 
the Native Administration Act made the British Crown, rather than paramount chiefs, the supreme head over all African affairs, the Native Land and Trust Act complemented the 1913 Native Land Act and Indiana the same year, the Representation of Natives Act removed previous black voters from the Cape voters' role and allowed them to elect three whites to Parliament. One of the first pieces of segregating legislation enacted by Jan Smuts' United Party government was the Asiatic Land Tenure Bill, which banned land sales to Indians. The United Party government began to move away from the rigid enforcement of segregationist laws during World War II. Amid fears integration would eventually lead to racial assimilation, the legislature established the Sauer Commission to investigate the effects of the United Party's policies. The commission concluded that integration would bring about a loss of personality for all racial groups. Legislation The Union of South Africa had allowed social custom and law to govern the consideration of multiracial affairs and of the allocation, in racial terms of access to economic, social, and political status. Most white South Africans, regardless of their own differences, accepted the prevailing pattern. Nevertheless, by 1948 it remained apparent that there were occasional gaps in the social structure, whether legislated or otherwise, concerning the rights and opportunities of non-whites. The rapid economic development of World War II attracted black migrant workers in large numbers to chief industrial centers, where they compensated for the wartime shortage of white labor. However, this escalated rate of black urbanization went unrecognized by the South African government, which failed to accommodate the influx with parallel expansion in housing or social services. Overcrowding spiking crime rates, and disillusionment resulted, urban blacks came to support a new generation of leaders influenced by the principles of self-determination and popular freedoms enshrined in such statements as the Atlantic Charter. Whites reacted negatively to the changes, allowing the Hrenig Nationali Party to convince a large segment of the voting bloc that the impotence of the United Party in curtailing the evolving position of non-whites indicated that the organization had fallen under the influence of Western liberals. Many Afrikaners, whites chiefly of Dutch descent but with early infusions of Germans and French Huguenots who were soon assimilated, also resented what they perceived as disempowerment by an underpaid black workforce and the superior economic power and prosperity of white English speakers. In addition, Jan Smuts, as a strong advocate of the United Nations, lost domestic support when South Africa was criticized for its color bar and the continued mandate of South West Africa by other UN member states. Disenfranchisement of Colored Voters Afrikaner nationalists proclaimed that they offered the voters a new policy to ensure continued white domination. This policy was initially expounded from a theory drafted by Hendrik Vervoort and was presented to the National Party by the Sauer Commission. It called for a systematic effort to organize the relations, rights, and privileges of the races as officially defined through a series of parliamentary acts and administrative decrees. Segregation had thus been pursued only in major matters, such as separate schools, and local society rather than law had been depended upon to enforce most separation, it should now be extended to everything. The party gave this policy a name a Euro apartheid. Apartheid was to be the basic ideological and practical foundation of Afrikaner politics for the next quarter of a century. Division among whites The National Party's election platform stressed that apartheid would preserve a market for white employment in which non-whites could not compete. On the issues of black urbanization, 
the regulation of non-white labor, influx control, social security, farm tariffs, and non-white taxation the United Party's policy remained contradictory and confused. Its traditional bases of support not only took mutually exclusive positions, but found themselves increasingly at odds with each other. Smut's reluctance to consider South African foreign policy against the mounting tensions of the Cold War also stirred up discontent, while the nationalists promised to purge the state and public service of communist sympathizers. First to desert the United Party were Afrikaner farmers, who wished to see a change in influx control due to problems with squatters, as well as higher prices for their maize and other produce in the face of the mine owners' demand for cheap food policies. Always identified with the affluent and capitalist, the party also failed to appeal to its working class constituents. Populist rhetoric allowed the National Party to sweep eight constituencies in the mining and industrial centers of the Witwatersrand and five more in Pretoria. Barring the predominantly English-speaking landowner electorate of the Natal, the United Party was defeated in almost every rural district. Its urban losses in the nation's most populous province, the Transvaal, proved equally devastating. As the voting system was disproportionately weighted in favor of rural constituencies and the Transvaal in particular, the 1948 election catapulted the Hrenig Nationali Party from a small minority party to a commanding position with an eight-vote parliamentary lead. Daniel Frana Ois Malin became the first nationalist prime minister with the aim of implementing the apartheid philosophy and silencing liberal opposition. Homeland System Glenn Gray Act, Natal Legislative Assembly Bill, Transvaal Asiatic Registration Act, South Africa Act, Mines and Works Act, Natives Land Act, Natives Act, Immorality Act, Native Administration Act Women's Enfranchisement Act, Franchise Laws Amendment Act, Representation of Natives Act, Native Trust and Land Act, Native Consolidation Act, Immorality Amendment Act A Euro, Population Registration Act, Group Areas Act, Suppression of Communism Act, Native Building Workers Act, Separate Representation of Voters Act, Prevention of Illegal Squatting Act, Bantu Authorities Act, Native Laws Amendment Act A Euro, Pass Laws Act, Public Safety Act, Native Labor Act, Bantu Education Act, Reservation of Separate Amenities Act, Natives Resettlement Act, Group Areas Development Act, Riotous Assemblies Act, Industrial Conciliation Act, Natives Act, Immorality Act Bantu Investment Corporation Act Extension of University Education Act Promotion of Bantu Self-Government Act Unlawful Organizations Act Indemnity Act Colored Persons Communal Reserves Act Republic of South Africa Constitution Act Urban Bantu Councils Act General Law Amendment Act Separate Representation of Voters Amendment Act, Prohibition of Political Interference Act, Bantu Homelands Citizenship Act, Bantu Homelands Constitution Act, Aliens Control Act, Indemnity Act, National Key Points Act, List of National Key Points, Internal Security Act, Black Local Authorities Act. Interim Constitution Promotion of National Unity and Reconciliation Act NP leaders argued that South Africa did not comprise a single nation, but was made up of four distinct racial groups, white, black, colored and Indian. Such groups were split into 13 nations or racial federations. White people encompassed the English and Afrikaans language groups, the black populace was divided into ten such groups. <laughs>
International Recognition of the Bantu Stands The state passed laws that paved the way for a grand apartheid, which was centered on separating races on a large scale, by compelling people to live in separate places defined by race. This strategy was in part adopted from leftover British rule that separated different racial groups after they took control of the Boer republics in the Anglo-Boer War. This created the black-only townships or locations, where blacks were relocated to their own towns. In addition, petty apartheid laws were passed. The principal apartheid laws were as follows. Forced Removals the first grand apartheid law was the Population Registration Act of 1950, which formalized racial classification and introduced an identity card for all persons over the age of 18, specifying their racial group. Official teams or boards were established to come to a conclusion on those people whose race was unclear. This caused difficulty, especially for colored people separating their families when members were allocated different races. Support for guerrilla groups such as UNITA in Angola and RENAMO in Mozambique, South African Defense Force raids into frontline states. Bombing raids were also conducted into neighboring states. Air and commando raids into Zimbabwe, Zambia and Botswana occurred the same day, against ANC targets an assassination attempt on Robert Mugabe, Prime Minister and future President of Zimbabwe, on December 18, 1981, a full-scale intervention into Angola, this was partly in support of UNITA, but was also an attempt to strike at planned bases, bomb attacks in Lesotho, kidnapping of refugees and ANC members in Swaziland by security services, an unsuccessful South African organized coup in the Seychelles on November 25, 1981, terrorist targeting of exiled ANC leaders abroad, Joe Slovo's wife Ruth first was killed by a parcel bomb in Maputo, and death squads of the Civil Cooperation Bureau and the Directorate of Military Intelligence attempted to carry out assassinations on ANC targets in Brussels, Paris, Stockholm, and London. The second pillar of Grand Apartheid was the Group Areas Act of 1950. Until then, most settlements had people of different races living side by side. This act put an end to diverse areas and determined where one lived according to race. Each race was allotted its own area, which was used in later years as a basis of forced removal. The Prevention of Illegal Squatting Act of 1951 allowed the government to demolish black shanty town slums and forced white employers to pay for the construction of housing for those black workers who were permitted to reside in cities otherwise reserved for whites. The Prohibition of Mixed Marriages Act of 1949 prohibited marriage between persons of different races and the Immorality Act of 1950 made sexual relations with a person of a different race a criminal offense. F. W. de Klerk, I apologize in my capacity as leader of the NP to the millions who suffered wrenching disruption of forced removals, who suffered the shame of being arrested for past law offenses, who over the decades suffered the indignities and humiliation of racial discrimination, Mart Hinus. Van Schalkwijk, the National Party brought development to a section of South Africa, but also brought suffering through a system grounded on injustice, in a statement shortly after the National Party voted to disband, Adrian Vlock washed the feet of apartheid victim Frank Chicane in an act of apology for the wrongs of the apartheid regime, Leon Wessels. I am now more convinced than ever that apartheid was a terrible mistake that blighted our land. South Africans did not listen to the laughing and the crying of each other. I am sorry that I had been so hard of hearing for so long. Under the Reservation of Separate Amenities Act of 1953, 
municipal grounds could be reserved for a particular race, creating, among other things, separate beaches, buses, hospitals, schools, and universities. Signboards such as whites only applied to public areas, even including park benches. Blacks were provided with services greatly inferior to those of whites, and, to a lesser extent, to those of Indian and colored people. Petty Apartheid Colored Classification Women under Apartheid Sport under Apartheid Further laws had the aim of suppressing resistance, especially armed resistance, to apartheid. The Suppression of Communism Act of 1950 banned any party subscribing to communism. The act defined communism and its aims so sweepingly that anyone who opposed government policy risked being labeled as a communist. Since the law specifically stated that communism aimed to disrupt racial harmony, it was frequently used to gag opposition to apartheid. Disorderly gatherings were banned, as were certain organizations that were deemed threatening to the government. Education was segregated by the 1953 Bantu Education Act, which crafted a separate system of education for black South African students and was designed to prepare black people for lives as a laboring class. In 1959 separate universities were created for black, colored and Indian people. Existing universities were not permitted to enroll new black students. The Afrikaans Medium Decree of 1974 required the use of Afrikaans and English on an equal basis in high schools outside the homelands. The Bantu Authorities Act of 1951 created separate government structures for blacks and whites and was the first piece of legislation to support the government's plan of separate development in the Bantu stands. The promotion of Black Self-Government Act of 1959 entrenched the NP policy of nominally independent homelands for blacks. So-called self-euro governing Bantu units were proposed, which would have devolved administrative powers, with the promise later of autonomy and self-government. It also abolished the seats of white representatives of black South Africans and removed from the rolls the few blacks still qualified to vote. The Bantu Investment Corporation Act of 1959 set up a mechanism to transfer capital to the homelands to create employment there. Legislation of 1967 allowed the government to stop industrial development in white cities and redirect such development to the homelands. The Black Homeland Citizenship Act of 1970 marked a new phase in the Bantu Stan strategy. It changed the status of blacks to citizens of one of the ten autonomous territories. The aim was to ensure a demographic majority of white people within South Africa by having all ten Bantu stands achieve full independence. Interracial contact in sport was frowned upon, but there were no segregatory sports laws. The government tightened pass laws compelling blacks to carry identity documents, to prevent the immigration of blacks from other countries. To reside in a city, blacks had to be in employment there. Until 1956 women were for the most part excluded from these pass requirements, as attempts to introduce pass laws for women were met with fierce resistance. In 1950, D. F. Mallon announced the NP's intention to create a colored affairs department. J. G. Stridham, Mallon's successor as Prime Minister, moved to strip voting rights from black and colored residents of the Cape province. The previous government had introduced the separate representation of voters bill into Parliament in 1951, however, four voters, G. Harris, W. D. Franklin, W. D. Collins and Edgar Dean, challenged its validity in court with support from the United Party. The Cape Supreme Court upheld the act, 
but reversed by the appeal court, finding the act invalid because a two-thirds majority in a joint sitting of both Houses of Parliament was needed to change the entrenched clauses of the Constitution. The government then introduced the High Court of Parliament bill, which gave Parliament the power to overrule decisions of the court. The Cape Supreme Court and the Appeal Court declared this invalid too. In 1955 the Striatum government increased the number of judges in the Appeal Court from 5 to 11, and appointed pro-nationalist judges to fill the new places. In the same year they introduced the Senate Act, which increased the Senate from 49 seats to 89. Adjustments were made such that the NP controlled 77 of these seats. The Parliament met in a joint sitting and passed the Separate Representation of Voters Act in 1956, which transferred colored voters from the common voters' role in the Cape to a new colored voters' role. Immediately after the vote, the Senate was restored to its original size. The Senate Act was contested in the Supreme Court but the recently enlarged appeal court, packed with government-supporting judges, upheld the act, and also the act to remove colored voters. Asians during apartheid The 1956 law allowed coloreds to elect four people to parliament, but a 1969 law abolished those seats and stripped coloreds of their right to vote. Since Asians had never been allowed to vote, this resulted in whites being the sole enfranchised group. A 2016 study in the Journal of Politics suggests that disenfranchisement in South Africa had a significant negative impact on basic service delivery to the disenfranchised. Before South Africa became a republic in 1961, politics among white South Africans was typified by the division between the mainly Afrikaner pro-republic conservative and the largely English anti-republican liberal sentiments, with the legacy of the Boer War still a factor for some people. Once South Africa became a republic, Prime Minister Hendrik Vervoort called for improved relations and greater accord between people of British descent and the Afrikaners. He claimed that the only difference was between those in favor of apartheid and those against it. The ethnic division would no longer be between Afrikaans and English speakers, but between blacks and whites. Conservatism Internal resistance International relations during apartheid most Afrikaners supported the notion of unanimity of white people to ensure their safety. White voters of British descent were divided. Many had opposed a republic, leading to a majority no vote in Natal. Later, some of them recognized the perceived need for white unity, convinced by the growing trend of decolonization elsewhere in Africa, which concerned them. British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan's Wind of Change speech left the British faction feeling that the UK had abandoned them. The more conservative English speakers supported for Vort, others were troubled by the severing of ties with the UK and remained loyal to the Crown. They were displeased by having to choose between British and South African nationalities. Although for Vort tried to bond these different blocs, the subsequent voting illustrated only a minor swell of support, indicating that a great many English speakers remained apathetic and that Fervord had not succeeded in uniting the white population. Under the homeland system, the government attempted to divide South Africa into a number of separate states, each of which was supposed to develop into a separate nation-state for a different ethnic group. Territorial separation was hardly a new institution. There were, for example, the reserves created under the British government in the 19th century. Under apartheid, 13 percent of the land was reserved for black homelands, a relatively small amount compared with the total population, 
and generally in economically unproductive areas of the country. The Tomlinson Commission of 1954 justified apartheid and the homeland system, but stated that additional land ought to be given to the homelands, a recommendation that was not carried out. When Fervort became Prime Minister in 1958, the policy of separate development came into being, with the homeland structure as one of its cornerstones. Fervort came to believe in the granting of independence to these homelands. The government justified its plans on the ostensible basis that government's policy is, therefore, not a policy of discrimination on the grounds of race or color but a policy of differentiation on the ground of nationhood, of different nations, granting to each self-determination within the borders of their homelands a euro hence this policy of separate development. Under the homelands system, blacks would no longer be citizens of South Africa, becoming citizens of the independent homelands who worked in South Africa as foreign migrant laborers on temporary work permits. In 1958 the Promotion of Black Self-Government Act was passed, and Border Industries and the Bantu Investment Corporation were established to promote economic development and the provision of employment in or near the homelands. Many black South Africans who had never resided in their identified homeland were forcibly removed from the cities to the homelands. Ten homelands were allocated to different black ethnic groups, Lebawa, Kwekwe, Boputaswana, KwaZulu, Kongwane, Transke and Siske, Gazankolu, Venda and Kwandabele. Four of these were declared independent by the South African government, Transke in 1976, Boputaswana in 1977, Venda in 1979 and Siske in 1981. Once a homeland was granted its nominal independence, its designated citizens had their South African citizenship revoked and replaced with citizenship in their homeland. These people were then issued passports instead of passbooks. Citizens of the nominally autonomous homelands also had their South African citizenship circumscribed meaning they were no longer legally considered South African. The South African government attempted to draw an equivalence between their view of black citizens of the homelands and the problems which other countries faced through entry of illegal immigrants. Commonwealth Bantu stands within the borders of South Africa were classified as self-governing or independent. In theory, Self-governing Bantu stands had control over many aspects of their internal functioning but were not yet sovereign nations. Independent Bantu stands were intended to be fully sovereign. In reality, they had no significant economic infrastructure and with few exceptions encompassed swaths of disconnected territory. This meant all the Bantu stands were little more than puppet states controlled by South Africa. Throughout the existence of the independent Bantu stands, South Africa remained the only country to recognize their independence. Nevertheless, internal organizations of many countries, as well as the South African government, lobbied for their recognition. For example, upon the foundation of Transke, the Swiss South African Association encouraged the Swiss government to recognize the new state. In 1976, leading up to a United States House of Representatives resolution urging the president to not recognize Trans-K, the South African government intensely lobbied lawmakers to oppose the bill. Each TBVC state extended recognition to the other independent Bantu stands while South Africa showed its commitment to the notion of TBVC sovereignty by building embassies in the TBVC capitals. During the 1960s, 1970s and early 1980s, the government implemented a policy of resettlement, to force people to move to their designated group areas.
millions of people were forced to relocate. These removals included people relocated due to slum clearance programs, labor tenants on white-owned farms, the inhabitants of the so-called black spots, the families of workers living in townships close to the homelands, and surplus people from urban areas including thousands of people from the Western Cape who were moved to the Transke and Siske homelands. The best publicized forced removals of the 1950s occurred in Johannesburg, when 60,000 people were moved to the new township of Soweto. Until 1955, Sophia Town had been one of the few urban areas where black people were allowed to own land and was slowly developing into a multiracial slum. As industry in Johannesburg grew, Sophia Town became the home of a rapidly expanding black workforce, as it was convenient and close to town. It had the only swimming pool for black children in Johannesburg. As one of the oldest black settlements in Johannesburg, it held an almost symbolic importance for the 50,000 black people it contained. Despite a vigorous ANC protest campaign and worldwide publicity, the removal of Sophia Town began on February 9, 1955 under the Western Area's removal scheme. In the early hours, heavily armed police forced residents out of their homes and loaded their belongings onto government trucks. The residents were taken to a large tract of land 19 kilometers from the city center, known as Meadowlands, which the government had purchased in 1953. Meadowlands became part of a new planned black city called Soweto. Sophia Town was destroyed by bulldozers, and a new white suburb named Triumph was built in its place. This pattern of forced removal and destruction was to repeat itself over the next few years, and was not limited to black South Africans alone. Forced removals from areas like Cato Manor in Durban, and District 6 in Cape Town, where 55,000 colored and Indian people were forced to move to new townships on the Cape Flats, were carried out under the Group Areas Act of 1950. Nearly 600,000 colored, Indian and Chinese people were moved under the Group Areas Act. Some 40,000 whites were also forced to move when land was transferred from white South Africa into the black homelands. These whites however had the benefit of support from the government which the black population did not. The NP passed a string of legislation that became known as Petty Apartheid. The first of these was the Prohibition of Mixed Marriages Act 55 of 1949, prohibiting marriage between whites and people of other races. The Immorality Amendment Act 21 of 1950 forbade unlawful racial intercourse and any immoral or indecent act between a white and a black, Indian, or colored person. Blacks were not allowed to run businesses or professional practices in areas designated as White South Africa unless they had a permit. They were required to move to the black homelands and set up businesses and practices there. Transport and civil facilities were segregated. Trains, hospitals, and ambulances were segregated. Because of the smaller numbers of white patients and the fact that white doctors preferred to work in white hospitals, conditions in white hospitals were much better than those in often overcrowded and understaffed black hospitals. Blacks were excluded from living or working in white areas, unless they had a pass, nicknamed the Dompas, also spelled Dompas or D-O-M Pass. The most likely origin of this name is from the Afrikaans Ferdom de Pa, although some commentators ascribe it to the Afrikaans words meaning dumb pass. Only blacks with Section 10 rights were excluded from this provision. A pass was issued only to a black with approved work. Spouses and children had to be left behind in black homelands. <laughs>
a pass was issued for one magisterial district confining the holder to that area only. Being without a valid pass made a person subject to arrest and trial for being an illegal migrant. This was often followed by deportation to the person's homeland and prosecution of the employer for employing an illegal migrant. Police vans patrolled white areas to round up blacks without passes. Blacks were not allowed to employ whites in white South Africa. Although trade unions for black and colored workers had existed since the early 20th century, it was not until the 1980s reforms that a mass black trade union movement developed. Trade unions under apartheid were racially segregated, with 54 unions being white only, 38 for Indian and colored and 19 for black people. The Industrial Conciliation Act legislated against the creation of multiracial trade unions and attempted to split existing multiracial unions into separate branches or organizations along racial lines. In the 1970s the state spent ten times more per child on the education of white children than on black children within the Bantu education system. Higher education was provided in separate universities and colleges after 1959. Eight black universities were created in the homelands. Fort Hare University in the Siske was to register only Kosa-speaking students. Sotho, Swana, Petty, and Venda speakers were placed at the newly founded University College of the North at Turf Loop while the University College of Zululand was launched to serve Zulu students. Coloreds and Indians were to have their own establishments in the Cape and Natal respectively. Each black homeland controlled its own education, health, and police systems. Blacks were not allowed to buy hard liquor. They were able only to buy state-produced poor-quality beer. Public beaches were racially segregated. Public swimming pools, some pedestrian bridges, in cinema parking spaces, graveyards, parks, and public toilets were segregated. Cinemas and theaters in white areas were not allowed to admit blacks. There were practically no cinemas in black areas. Most restaurants and hotels in white areas were not allowed to admit blacks except as staff. Blacks were prohibited from attending white churches under the Church's Native Laws Amendment Act of 1957, but this was never rigidly enforced and churches were one of the few places races could mix without the interference of the law. Blacks earning 360 rand a year or more had to pay taxes while the white threshold was more than twice as high, at 750 rand a year. On the other hand, the taxation rate for whites was considerably higher than that for blacks. Blacks could never acquire land in white areas. In the homelands, much of the land belonged to a tribe where the local chieftain would decide how the land had to be used. This resulted in whites owning almost all the industrial and agricultural lands and much of the prized residential land. Most blacks were stripped of their South African citizenship when the homelands became independent, and they were no longer able to apply for South African passports. Eligibility requirements for a passport had been difficult for blacks to meet, the government contending that a passport was a privilege, not a right, and the government did not grant many passports to blacks. Apartheid pervaded culture as well as the law, and was entrenched by most of the mainstream media. United Nations Catholic Church the population was classified into four groups, black, white, Indian and colored. The colored group included people regarded as being of mixed descent, including of Bantu, Khoisan, European and Malay ancestry. Many were descended from people brought to South Africa from other parts of the world, 
such as India, Sri Lanka, Madagascar, and China as slaves and indentured workers. The apartheid bureaucracy devised complex criteria at the time that the Population Registration Act was implemented to determine who was colored. Minor officials would administer tests to determine if someone should be categorized either colored or black, or if another person should be categorized either colored or white. Different members of the same family found themselves in different race groups. Further tests determined membership of the various subracial groups of the coloreds. Many of those who formerly belonged to this racial group are opposed to the continuing use of the term colored in the post-apartheid era, though the term no longer signifies any legal meaning. The expressions so-called colored and brown people acquired a wide usage in the 1980s. Organization for African Unity Discriminated against by apartheid Coloreds were as a matter of state policy forced to live in separate townships, in some cases leaving homes their families had occupied for generations, and received an inferior education, though better than that provided to blacks. They played an important role in the anti-apartheid movement, for example the African political organization established in 1902 had an exclusively colored membership. Outward-looking policy Sports and culture Beginning Isolation Fervort years Forster years Cultural boycott Western influence The Cold War and total onslaught Foreign military operations State Security State of Emergency Final Years of Apartheid Factors Voting rights were denied to coloreds in the same way that they were denied to blacks from 1950 to 1983. However, in 1977 the NP caucus approved proposals to bring coloreds and Indians into central government. In 1982, final constitutional proposals produced a referendum among whites, and the tricameral parliament was approved. The constitution was reformed the following year to allow the colored and Asian minorities participation in separate houses in a tricameral parliament, and Bota became the first executive state president. The idea was that the colored minority could be granted voting rights but the black majority were to become citizens of independent homelands. These separate arrangements continued until the abolition of apartheid. The tricameral reforms led to the formation of the United Democratic Front as a vehicle to try to prevent the CO option of coloreds and Indians into an alliance with whites. The battles between the UDF and the NP government from 1983 to 1989 were to become the most intense period of struggle between left-wing and right-wing South Africans. Colonialism and apartheid had a major impact on black and colored women, since they suffered both racial and gender discrimination. Jobs were often hard to find. Many black and colored women worked as agricultural or domestic workers, but wages were extremely low, if existent. Children suffered from diseases caused by malnutrition and sanitation problems, and mortality rates were therefore high. The controlled movement of black and colored workers within the country through the Natives Urban Areas Act of 1923 and the pass law separated family members from one another because men could prove their employment in urban centers while most women were merely dependents, consequently, they risked being deported to rural areas. By the 1930s, association football mirrored the Bokanist Society of South Africa, football was divided into numerous institutions based on race, the South African Football Association, the South African Indian Football Association, 
the South African African Football Association and its rival the South African Bantu Football Association, and the South African Coloured Football Association. Lack of funds to provide proper equipment would be noticeable in regards to black amateur football matches, this revealed the unequal lives black South Africans were subject to, in contrast to whites, who were obviously much better off financially. Apartheid's social engineering made it more difficult to compete across racial lines. Thus, in an effort to centralize finances, the federations merged in 1951, creating the South African Soccer Federation, which brought black, Indian, and colored national associations into one body that opposed apartheid. This was generally opposed more and more by the growing apartheid government, and a euro with urban segregation being reinforced with ongoing racist policies a euro it was harder to play football along these racial lines. In 1956, the Pretoria regime a euro the administrative capital of South Africa a euro passed the first apartheid sports policy, by doing so. It emphasized the white-led government's opposition to interracialism. While football was plagued by racism, it also played a role in protesting apartheid and its policies. With the international bans from FIFA and other major sporting events, South Africa would be in the spotlight internationally. In a 1977 survey, White South Africans ranked the lack of international sport as one of the three most damaging consequences of apartheid. By the mid-1950s, black South Africans would also use media to challenge the racialization of sports in South Africa. Anti-apartheid forces had begun to pinpoint sport as the weakness of white national morale. Black journalists for the Johannesburg Drum magazine were the first to give the issue public exposure, with an intrepid special issue in 1955 that asked, why shouldn't our blacks be allowed in the SA team? As time progressed, international standing with South Africa would continue to be strained. In the 1980s, as the oppressive system was slowly collapsing the ANC and National Party started negotiations on the end of apartheid. Football associations also discussed the formation of a single, non-racial controlling body. This unity process accelerated in the late 1980s and led to the creation, in December 1991, of an incorporated South African Football Association. On July 3, 1992, FIFA finally welcomed South Africa back into international football. Sport has long been an important part of life in South Africa, and the boycotting of games by international teams had a profound effect on the white population, perhaps more so than the trade embargoes did. After the reacceptance of South Africa's sports teams by the international community, Sport played a major unifying role between the country's diverse ethnic groups. Mandela's open support of the predominantly white rugby fraternity during the 1995 Rugby World Cup was considered instrumental in bringing together South African sports fans of all races. Defining its Asian population, a minority that did not appear to belong to any of the initial three designated non white groups, was a constant dilemma for the apartheid government. For political reasons, the classification of honorary white was granted to immigrants from Japan, South Korea and Taiwan a Euro countries with which South Africa maintained diplomatic and economic relations a Euro and to their descendants. Indian South Africans during apartheid were classified many ranges of categories from Asian to black to colored and even the monoethnic category of Indian, but never as white, having been considered non-white throughout South Africa's history. The group faced severe discrimination during the apartheid regime and were subject to numerous racialist policies. <laughs>
Chinese South Africans a euro who were descendants of migrant workers who came to work in the gold mines around Johannesburg in the late 19th century a euro were initially either classified as colored or other Asian and were subject to numerous forms of discrimination and restriction. It was not until 1984 that South African Chinese, increased to about 10,000, were given the same official rights as the Japanese to be treated as whites in terms of the Group Areas Act, although they still faced discrimination and did not receive all the benefits slash rights of their newly obtained honorary white status such as voting. Indonesians arrived at the Cape of Good Hope as slaves until the abolishment of slavery during the 1800s. They were predominantly Muslim were allowed religious freedom and formed their own ethnic group slash community known as Cape Malays. They were classified as part of the colored racial group. This was the same for South Africans of Malaysian descent who were also classified as part of the colored race and thus considered not white. South Africans of Filipino descent were classified as black due to historical outlook on Filipinos by white South Africans, and many of them lived in Bantu stands. Alongside apartheid the NP government implemented a program of social conservatism. Pornography and gambling were banned. Cinemas Shops selling alcohol and most other businesses were forbidden from operating on Sundays. Abortion, homosexuality, and sex education were also restricted. Abortion was legal only in cases of rape or if the mother's life was threatened. Television was not introduced until 1976 because the government viewed English programming as a threat to the Afrikaans language. Television was run on apartheid lines a Euro TV1 broadcast in Afrikaans and English, TV2 in Zulu and Kosa and TV3 in Sotho, Tswana, and Petty, and TV4 mostly showed programs for an urban black audience. Apartheid sparked significant internal resistance. The government responded to a series of popular uprisings and protests with police brutality which in turn increased local support for the armed resistance struggle. Internal resistance to the apartheid system in South Africa came from several sectors of society and saw the creation of organizations dedicated variously to peaceful protests, passive resistance, and armed insurrection. In 1949, the youth wing of the African National Congress took control of the organization and started advocating a radical black nationalist program. The new young leaders proposed that white authority could only be overthrown through mass campaigns. In 1950 that philosophy saw the launch of the program of action, a series of strikes, boycotts, and civil disobedience actions that led to occasional violent clashes with the authorities. In 1959, a group of disenchanted ANC members formed the Pan-Africanist Congress, which organized a demonstration against pass books on March 21, 1960. One of those protests was held in the township of Sharpeville where 69 people were killed by police in the Sharpeville massacre. In the wake of Sharpeville, the government declared a state of emergency. More than 18,000 people were arrested, including leaders of the ANC and PAC, and both organizations were banned. The resistance went underground with some leaders in exile abroad and others engaged in campaigns of domestic sabotage and terrorism. In May 1961, before the declaration of South Africa as a republic, an assembly representing the banned ANC called for negotiations between the members of the different ethnic groupings, threatening demonstrations and strikes during the inauguration of the republic if their calls were ignored. When the government overlooked them, the strikers carried out their threats. In 
The government countered swiftly by giving police the authority to arrest people for up to 12 days and detaining many strike leaders amid numerous cases of police brutality. Defeated, the protesters called off their strike. The ANC then chose to launch an armed struggle through a newly formed military wing, Umkanto We Size We, which would perform acts of sabotage on tactical state structures. Its first sabotage plans were carried out on December 16, 1961, the anniversary of the Battle of Blood River. In the 1970s, the Black Consciousness Movement was created by tertiary students influenced by the Black Power Movement in the U.S. B.C. endorsed Black Pride and African customs and did much to alter the feelings of inadequacy instilled among Black people by the apartheid system. The leader of the movement, Steve Biko, was taken into custody on August 18, 1977 and was beaten to death in detention. In 1976, secondary students in Soweto took to the streets in the Soweto uprising to protest against the imposition of Afrikaans as the only language of instruction. On June 16, police opened fire on students protesting peacefully. According to official reports 23 people were killed, but the number of people who died is usually given as 176 with estimates of up to 700. In the following years several student organizations were formed to protest against apartheid, and these organizations were central to urban school boycotts in 1980 and 1983 and rural boycotts in 1985 and 1986. In parallel with student protests, Labor unions started protest action in 1973 and 1974. After 1976 unions and workers are considered to have played an important role in the struggle against apartheid, filling the gap left by the banning of political parties. In 1979, black trade unions were legalized and could engage in collective bargaining, although strikes were still illegal. Economist Thomas Sowell wrote that basic supply and demand led to violations of apartheid on a massive scale throughout the nation, simply because there were not enough white South African business owners to meet the demand for various goods and services. Large portions of the garment industry and construction of new homes, for example, were effectively owned and operated by blacks who either worked surreptitiously or who circumvented the law with a white person as a nominal, figurehead manager. In 1983, anti-apartheid leaders determined to resist the tricameral parliament assembled to form the United Democratic Front in order to coordinate anti-apartheid activism inside South Africa. The first presidents of the UDF were Archie Gumd, Oscar Mbetha, and Albertina Sisulu, patrons were Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Dr. Alan Bozak, Helen Joseph, and Nelson Mandela. Basing its platform on abolishing apartheid and creating a non-racial democratic South Africa, the UDF provided a legal way for domestic human rights groups and individuals of all races to organize demonstrations and campaign against apartheid inside the country. Churches and church groups also emerged as pivotal points of resistance. Church leaders were not immune to prosecution, and certain faith-based organizations were banned but the clergy generally had more freedom to criticize the government than militant groups did. The UDF, coupled with the protection of the church, accordingly permitted a major role for Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who served both as a prominent domestic voice and international spokesperson denouncing apartheid and urging the creation of a shared non-racial state. Although the majority of whites supported apartheid, some 20% did not. Parliamentary opposition was galvanized by Helen Sussman, Colin Eglin, and Harry Swartz, who formed the Progressive Federal Party.
Extra-parliamentary resistance was largely centered in the South African Communist Party and women's organization the Black Sash. Women were also notable in their involvement in trade union organizations and banned political parties. South Africa's policies were subject to international scrutiny in 1960, when Macmillan criticized them during his celebrated Wind of Change speech in Cape Town. Weeks later, tensions came to a head in the Sharpeville massacre, resulting in more international condemnation. Soon afterwards Fervort announced a referendum on whether the country should become a republic. Fervort lowered the voting age for whites to 18 and included whites in South West Africa on the roll. The referendum on October 5 that year asked whites, are you in favor of a republic for the union, and 52% voted yes. As a consequence of this change of status, South Africa needed to reapply for continued membership of the Commonwealth, with which it had privileged trade links. India had become a republic within the Commonwealth in 1950, but it became clear that African and Asian member states would oppose South Africa due to its apartheid policies. As a result, South Africa withdrew from the Commonwealth on May 31, 1961, the day that the Republic came into existence. We stand here today to salute the United Nations Organization and its member states, both singly and collectively, for joining forces with the masses of our people in a common struggle that has brought about our emancipation and pushed back the frontiers of racism. At the first UN gathering in 1946, South Africa was placed on the agenda. The primary subject in question was the handling of South African Indians, a great cause of divergence between South Africa and India. In 1952, apartheid was again discussed in the aftermath of the Defiance Campaign, and the UN set up a task team to keep watch on the progress of apartheid and the racial state of affairs in South Africa. Although South Africa's racial policies were a cause for concern, most countries in the UN concurred that this was a domestic affair, which fell outside the UN's jurisdiction. In April 1960, the UN's conservative stance on apartheid changed following the Sharpeville massacre, and the Security Council for the first time agreed on concerted action against the apartheid regime, demanding an end to racial separation and discrimination. From 1960 the ANC began a campaign of armed struggle of which there would later be a charge of 193 acts of terrorism from 1961 to 1963, mainly bombings and murders of civilians. Instead, the South African government began further suppression, banning the ANC and PAC. In 1961, UN Secretary General Dag Hamarskja LD stopped over in South Africa and subsequently stated that he had been unable to reach agreement with Prime Minister Vervoort. In 1961, dismissing an Israeli vote against South African apartheid at the United Nations, Vervoort famously said, Israel is not consistent in its new anti-apartheid attitude a euro they took Israel away from the Arabs after the Arabs lived there for a thousand years. In that, I agree with them. Israel, like South Africa, is an apartheid state. On November 6, 1962, the United Nations General Assembly passed Resolution 1761, condemning apartheid policies. In 1966, the UN held the first of many colloquiums on apartheid. The General Assembly announced March 21 as the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, in memory of the Sharpeville Massacre. In 1971, the General Assembly formally denounced the institution of homelands 
and a motion was passed in 1974 to expel South Africa from the UN, but this was vetoed by France, the United Kingdom and the United States, all key trade associates of South Africa. On August 7, 1963 the United Nations Security Council passed Resolution 181, calling for a voluntary arms embargo against South Africa. In the same year a special committee against apartheid was established to encourage and oversee plans of action against the regime. From 1964 the US and the UK discontinued their arms trade with South Africa. The Security Council also condemned the Soweto massacre in Resolution 392. In 1977, the voluntary UN arms embargo became mandatory with the passing of Resolution 418. Economic sanctions against South Africa were also frequently debated as an effective way of putting pressure on the apartheid government. In 1962, the UN General Assembly requested that its members sever political, fiscal and transportation ties with South Africa. In 1968, it proposed ending all cultural, educational and sporting connections as well. Economic sanctions, however, were not made mandatory, because of opposition from South Africa's main trading partners. In 1973, the UN adopted the Apartheid Convention which defines apartheid and even qualifies it as a crime against humanity which might lead to international criminal prosecution of the individuals responsible for perpetrating it. This convention has however only been ratified by 107 of the 193 member states as of August 2008. The convention was initially drafted by the former USSR and Guinea, before being presented to the UN General Assembly. The convention was adopted with a vote of 91 for, and 4 against the convention. In 1978 and 1983 the Union condemned South Africa at the World Conference Against Racism. After much debate, by the late 1980s the United States, the United Kingdom, and 23 other nations had passed laws placing various trade sanctions on South Africa. A disinvestment from South Africa movement in many countries was similarly widespread, with individual cities and provinces around the world implementing various laws and local regulations forbidding registered corporations under their jurisdiction from doing business with South African firms, factories, or banks. Pope John Paul II was an outspoken opponent of apartheid. In 1985, while visiting the Netherlands, he gave an impassioned speech at the International Court of Justice condemning apartheid, proclaiming that no system of apartheid or separate development will ever be acceptable as a model for the relations between peoples or races. In September 1988 he made a pilgrimage to countries bordering South Africa, while demonstratively avoiding South Africa itself. During his visit to Zimbabwe, he called for economic sanctions against South Africa's government. The Organization of African Unity was created in 1963. Its primary objectives were to eradicate colonialism and improve social, political and economic situations in Africa. It censured apartheid and demanded sanctions against South Africa. African states agreed to aid the liberation movements in their fight against apartheid. In 1969, 14 nations from Central and East Africa gathered in Lusaka, Zambia, and formulated the Lusaka Manifesto, which was signed on April 13 by all of the countries in attendance except Malawi. This manifesto was later taken on by both the OAU and the United Nations.
the Lusaka Manifesto summarized the political situations of self-governing African countries, condemning racism and inequity, and calling for black majority rule in all African nations. It did not rebuff South Africa entirely, though, adopting an appeasing manner towards the apartheid government, and even recognizing its autonomy. Although African leaders supported the emancipation of black South Africans, they preferred this to be attained through peaceful means. South Africa's negative response to the Lusaka Manifesto and rejection of a change to its policies brought about another OAU announcement in October 1971. The Mogadishu Declaration stated that South Africa's rebuffing of negotiations meant that its black people could only be freed through military means, and that no African state should converse with the apartheid government. In 1966 B.J. Forster became Prime Minister. He was not prepared to dismantle apartheid but he did try to redress South Africa's isolation and to revitalize the country's global reputation, even those with black-ruled nations in Africa. This he called his outward-looking policy. Forster's willingness to talk to African leaders stood in contrast to Fervort's refusal to engage with leaders such as Abubakar Tafawa Bailwa of Nigeria in 1962 and Kenneth Konda of Zambia in 1964. In 1966, he met the heads of the neighboring states of Lesotho, Swaziland, and Botswana. In 1967, he offered technological and financial aid to any African state prepared to receive it, asserting that no political strings were attached, aware that many African states needed financial aid despite their opposition to South Africa's racial policies. Many were also tied to South Africa economically because of their migrant labor population working on the South African mines. Botswana, Lesotho, and Swaziland remained outspoken critics of apartheid, but depended on South Africa's economic aid. Malawi was the first country not on South African borders to accept South African aid. In 1967, the two states set out their political and economic relations, and, in 1969, Malawi became the only country at the assembly which did not sign the Lusaka Manifesto condemning South Africa apartheid policy. In 1970, Malawian President Hastings Banda made his first and most successful official stopover in South Africa. Associations with Mozambique followed suit and were sustained after that country won its sovereignty in 1975. Angola was also granted South African loans. Other countries which formed relationships with South Africa were Liberia, Ivory Coast, Madagascar, Mauritius, Gabon, Zaire, and the Central African Republic. Although these states condemned apartheid, South Africa's economic and military dominance meant that they remained dependent on South Africa to varying degrees. South Africa's isolation in sport began in the mid-1950s and increased throughout the 1960s. Apartheid forbade multiracial sport, which meant that overseas teams, by virtue of their having players of diverse races, could not play in South Africa. In 1956, the International Table Tennis Federation severed its ties with the all-white South African Table Tennis Union, preferring the non-racial South African Table Tennis Board. The apartheid government responded by confiscating the passports of the board's players so that they were unable to attend international games. In 1959, the Non-Racial South African Sports Association was formed to secure the rights of all players on the global field. After meeting with no success in its endeavors to attain credit by collaborating with white establishments, SASA approached the International Olympic Committee in 1962 
calling for South Africa's expulsion from the Olympic Games. The IOC sent South Africa a caution to the effect that, if there were no changes, they would be barred from the 1964 Olympic Games. The changes were initiated, and in January 1963, the South African Non-Racial Olympic Committee was set up. The anti-apartheid movement persisted in its campaign for South Africa's exclusion, and the IOC acceded in barring the country from the 1964 Games in Tokyo. South Africa selected a multiracial team for the next Games, and the IOC opted for incorporation in the 1968 Games in Mexico. Because of protests from AAMs and African nations, however, the IOC was forced to retract the invitation. Foreign complaints about South Africa's bigoted sports brought more isolation. Racially selected New Zealand sports teams toured South Africa, until the 1970 All Blacks rugby tour allowed Maori to go under the status of honorary whites. Huge and widespread protests occurred in New Zealand in 1981 against the Springbok Tour A Euro the government spent $8 million protecting games using the army and police force. A planned all-black tour to South Africa in 1985 remobilised the New Zealand protesters and it was cancelled. A rebel tour A Euro not government sanctioned A Euro went ahead in 1986 but after that sporting ties were cut, and New Zealand made a decision not to convey an authorised rugby team to South Africa until the end of apartheid. Forster replaced Fervort as Prime Minister in 1966 following the latter's assassination and declared that South Africa would no longer dictate to other countries what their teams should look like. Although this reopened the gate for international sporting meets, it did not signal the end of South Africa's racist sporting policies. In 1968 Forster went against his policy by refusing to permit Basil de Oliveira, a coloured South African-born cricketer, to join the English cricket team on its tour to South Africa. Forster said that the side had been chosen only to prove a point, and not on merit. After protests, However, Dolly was eventually included in the team. Protests against certain tours brought about the cancellation of a number of other visits, including that of an England rugby team touring South Africa in 1969-70. The first of the white bands occurred in 1971 when the chairman of the Australian Cricketing Association A Euro Sir Don Bradman A Euro flew to South Africa to meet Forster. Forster had expected Bradman to allow the tour of the Australian cricket team to go ahead, but things became heated after Bradman asked why black sportsmen were not allowed to play cricket. Forster stated that blacks were intellectually inferior and had no finesse for the game. Bradman A Euro thinking this ignorant and repugnant A Euro asked Forster if he had heard of a man named Gary Sobers. On his return to Australia, Bradman released a one-sentence statement, We will not play them until they choose a team on a non-racist basis. In South Africa, Forster vented his anger publicly against Bradman, while the African National Congress rejoiced. This was the first time a predominantly white nation had taken the side of multiracial sport, producing an unsettling resonance that more white boycotts were coming. Almost 20 years later, on his release from prison, Nelson Mandela asked a visiting Australian statesman if Donald Bradman, his childhood hero, was still alive. In 1971, Forster altered his policies even further by distinguishing multiracial from multinational sport. Multiracial sport, between teams with players of different races, remained outlawed, multinational sport, however, was now acceptable, 
international sides would not be subject to South Africa's racial stipulations. In 1978, Nigeria boycotted the Commonwealth Games because New Zealand's sporting contacts with the South African government were not considered to be in accordance with the 1977 Glen Eagles Agreement. Nigeria also led the 32-nation boycott of the 1986 Commonwealth Games because of British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher's ambivalent attitude towards sporting links with South Africa significantly affecting the quality and profitability of the games and thus thrusting apartheid into the international spotlight. In the 1960s, the anti-apartheid movements began to campaign for cultural boycotts of apartheid South Africa. Artists were requested not to present or let their works be hosted in South Africa. In 1963, 45 British writers put their signatures to an affirmation approving of the boycott, and, in 1964, American actor Marlon Brando called for a similar affirmation for films. In 1965, the Writers Guild of Great Britain called for a proscription on the sending of films to South Africa. Over 60 American artists signed a statement against apartheid and against professional links with the state. The presentation of some South African plays in Britain and the United States was also vetoed. After the arrival of television in South Africa in 1975, the British Actors' Union, Equity, boycotted the service and no British program concerning its associates could be sold to South Africa. Sporting and cultural boycotts did not have the same impact as economic sanctions, but they did much to lift consciousness amongst normal South Africans of the global condemnation of apartheid. While international opposition to apartheid grew, the Nordic countries A Euro and Sweden in particular A Euro provided both moral and financial support for the ANC. On February 21, 1986 A Euro a week before he was murdered A Euro Sweden's Prime Minister Olaf Palma made the keynote address to the Swedish People's Parliament against apartheid held in Stockholm. In addressing the hundreds of anti-apartheid sympathizers as well as leaders and officials from the ANC and the anti-apartheid movement such as Oliver Tambo, Palma declared, Apartheid cannot be reformed, it has to be eliminated. Other Western countries adopted a more ambivalent position. In Switzerland, the Swiss South African Association lobbied on behalf of the South African government. In the 1980s, the U.S. Reagan and U.K. Thatcher administrations followed a constructive engagement policy with the apartheid government, vetoing the imposition of U.N. economic sanctions, justified by a belief in free trade and a vision of South Africa as a bastion against Marxist forces in Southern Africa. Thatcher declared the ANC a terrorist organization, and in 1987 her spokesman, Bernard Ingham, famously said that anyone who believed that the ANC would ever form the government of South Africa was living in cloud cuckoo land. The American Legislative Exchange Council, a conservative lobbying organization, actively campaigned against divesting from South Africa throughout the 1980s. By the late 1980s, with the tide of the Cold War turning and no sign of a political resolution in South Africa, Western patience began to run out. By 1989, a bipartisan Republican-slash-Democratic initiative in the U.S. favored economic sanctions, the release of Nelson Mandela and a negotiated settlement involving the ANC. Thatcher too began to take a similar line but insisted on the suspension of the ANC's armed struggle. The UK's significant economic involvement in South Africa may have provided some leverage with the South African government, with both the UK and the US applying pressure and pushing for negotiations. However, 
neither the UK nor the US was willing to apply economic pressure upon their multinational interests in South Africa, such as the mining company Anglo-American. Although a high-profile compensation claim against these companies was thrown out of court in 2004, the U.S. Supreme Court in May 2008 upheld an appeal court ruling allowing another lawsuit that seeks damages of more than 400 billion U.S. dollars from major international companies which are accused of aiding South Africa's apartheid system. Institutional Racism Economic Contradictions Western Influence II Tricameral Parliament Reforms in contact with the ANC under BOTA Presidency of F.W. de Klerk Negotiations 1994 Election During the 1950s South African military strategy was decisively shaped by fears of communist espionage and a conventional Soviet threat to the strategic Cape trade route between the South Atlantic and Indian Oceans. The apartheid government supported the U.S.-led North Atlantic Treaty Organization, as well as its policy of regional containment against Soviet-backed regimes and insurgencies worldwide. By the late 1960s, the rise of Soviet client states on the African continent, as well as Soviet aid for militant anti-apartheid movements, was considered one of the primary external threats to the apartheid system. South African officials frequently accused domestic opposition groups of being communist proxies. For its part the Soviet Union viewed South Africa as a bastion of neocolonialism and a regional Western ally, which helped fuel its support for various anti-apartheid causes. From 1973 onward much of South Africa's white population increasingly looked upon their country as a bastion of the free world besieged militarily, politically and culturally by communism and radical black nationalism. The apartheid government perceived itself as being locked in a proxy struggle with the Warsaw Pact and by implication, armed wings of black nationalist forces such as Umkhonto We Sizwe and the People's Liberation Army of Namibia, which often received Soviet arms and training. This was described as total onslaught. South African initiatives designed to counter total onslaught were known as total strategy and involved building up a formidable conventional military and counterintelligence capability. Total strategy was built on the principles of counter-revolution as espoused by noted French tactician Andre Copyright Bofra. Considerable effort was devoted towards circumventing international arms sanctions, and the government even went so far as to develop nuclear weapons, allegedly with covert assistance from Israel. In 2010, The Guardian released South African government documents that revealed an Israeli offer to sell the apartheid regime nuclear weapons. Israel categorically denied these allegations and claimed that the documents were minutes from a meeting which did not indicate any concrete offer for a sale of nuclear weapons. Shimon Peres said that the Guardian's article was based on selective interpretation, and not on concrete facts. From the late 1970s to the late 1980s, defense budgets in South Africa were raised exponentially. Covered operations focused on espionage and domestic political manipulation became common, the number of special forces units swelled, and the South African Defence Force had amassed enough sophisticated conventional weaponry to pose a serious threat to the frontline states, a regional alliance of neighbouring countries opposed to apartheid. South Africa had a policy of attacking insurgent bases and safe houses of Plan and MK in neighboring countries beginning in the early 1980s. These attacks were in retaliation for acts of sabotage, urban terrorism and guerrilla raids by MK, Plan, and the Azanian People's Liberation Army.
The country also aided organizations in surrounding countries who were actively combating the spread of communism in southern Africa. The results of these policies included. In 1984, Mozambican President Samora Machel signed the Nkamati Accord with South Africa's President P.W. Bota, in an attempt to end South African support for the opposition group RENAMO. South Africa agreed to cease supporting anti-government forces, while the MK was prohibited from operating in Mozambique. This was a setback for the ANC. Machel hoped the agreement would alliterate the civil war and allow Mozambique to rebuild its economy. Two years later, President Machel was killed in an air crash in mountainous terrain in South Africa near the Mozambican border after returning from a meeting in Zambia. South Africa was accused by the Mozambican government and U.S. Secretary of State George P. Schultz of continuing its aid to Renamo. The Mozambican government also made an unproven allegation that the accident was caused intentionally by a false radio navigation beacon that scrambled the aircraft's navigational system. These charges were never proven and is still a subject of some controversy, despite the South African Margot Commission finding that the crash was an accident. A Soviet delegation that did not participate in the investigation issued a minority report implicating South Africa. Beginning in 1966, PLAN, armed wing of the South West African People's Organization, contested South Africa's occupation of South West Africa. This conflict deepened after Angola gained its independence in 1975 under the leadership of the leftist popular movement for the liberation of Angola aided by Cuba. South Africa, Zaire, and the United States sided with the Angolan rival UNITA party against the MPLA's armed force, FAPLA. The following struggle turned into one of several late Cold War flashpoints. The Angolan Civil War developed into a conventional war with South Africa and UNITA on one side against the MPLA government, the Soviet Union, the Cubans, and SWAPO on the other. During the 1980s the government, led by P.W. Bota, became increasingly preoccupied with security. It set up a powerful state security apparatus to protect the state against an anticipated upsurge in political violence that the reforms were expected to trigger. The 1980s became a period of considerable political unrest, with the government becoming increasingly dominated by Bota's circle of generals and police chiefs, who managed the various states of emergencies. Bota's years in power were marked also by numerous military interventions in the states bordering South Africa, as well as an extensive military and political campaign to eliminate SWAPO in Namibia. Within South Africa, meanwhile, vigorous police action and strict enforcement of security legislation resulted in hundreds of arrests and bans, and an effective end to the ANC sabotage campaign. The government punished political offenders brutally. 40,000 people annually were subjected to whipping as a form of punishment. The vast majority had committed political offenses and were lashed ten times for their crime. If convicted of treason, a person could be hanged, and the government executed numerous political offenders in this way. As the 1980s progressed, more and more anti-apartheid organizations were formed and affiliated with the UDF. Led by the Reverend Alan Bozak and Albertina Sisulu, the UDF called for the government to abandon its reforms and instead abolish apartheid and eliminate the homelands completely. Serious political violence was a prominent feature from 1985 to 1989 as black townships became the focus of the struggle between anti-apartheid organizations and the Bota government. Throughout the 1980s, 
township people resisted apartheid by acting against the local issues that faced their particular communities. The focus of much of this resistance was against the local authorities and their leaders, who were seen to be supporting the government. By 1985, it had become the ANC's aim to make black townships ungovernable by means of rent boycotts and other militant action. Numerous township councils were overthrown or collapsed, to be replaced by unofficial popular organizations, often led by militant youth. People's courts were set up, and residents accused of being government agents were dealt extreme and occasionally lethal punishments. Black town councillors and policemen, and sometimes their families, were attacked with petrol bombs, beaten, and murdered by necklacing, where a burning tire was placed around the victim's neck, after they were restrained by wrapping their wrists with barbed wire. This signature act of torture and murder was embraced by the ANC and its leaders. On July 20, 1985, Bota declared a state of emergency in 36 magisterial districts. Areas affected were the Eastern Cape, and the PWV region. Three months later the Western Cape was included. An increasing number of organizations were banned or listed, many individuals had restrictions such as house arrest imposed on them. During this state of emergency about 2,436 people were detained under the Internal Security Act. This act gave police and the military sweeping powers. The government could implement curfews controlling the movement of people. The president could rule by decree without referring to the constitution or to parliament. It became a criminal offense to threaten someone verbally or possess documents that the government perceived to be threatening, to advise anyone to stay away from work or oppose the government, and to disclose the name of anyone arrested under the state of emergency until the government released that name, with up to 10 years imprisonment for these offenses. Detention without trial became a common feature of the government's reaction to growing civil unrest and by 1988, 30,000 people had been detained. The media was censored, thousands were arrested and many were interrogated and tortured. On June 12, 1986, four days before the 10th anniversary of the Soweto Uprising, the state of emergency was extended to cover the whole country. The government amended the Public Security Act, including the right to declare unrest areas, allowing extraordinary measures to crush protests in these areas. Severe censorship of the press became a dominant tactic in the government's strategy and television cameras were banned from entering such areas. The state broadcaster, the South African Broadcasting Corporation, provided propaganda in support of the government. Media opposition to the system increased, supported by the growth of a pro-ANC underground press within South Africa. In 1987, the state of emergency was extended for another two years. Meanwhile, about 200,000 members of the National Union of Mine Workers commenced the longest strike in South African history. 1988 saw the banning of the activities of the UDF and other anti-apartheid organizations. Much of the violence in the late 1980s and early 1990s was directed at the government, but a substantial amount was between the residents themselves. Many died in violence between members of Nkothi and the UDF-ANC faction. It was later proven that the government manipulated the situation by supporting one side or the other when it suited it. Government agents assassinated opponents within South Africa and abroad, they undertook cross-border army and air force attacks on suspected ANC and PAC bases. The ANC and the PAC in return exploded bombs at restaurants, shopping centers, and government buildings such as magistrates' courts. <laughs>
between 1960 and 1994, according to statistics from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the Inkatha Freedom Party was responsible for 4,500 killings, South African security forces were responsible for 2,700 killings and the ANC was responsible for 1,300 killings. The state of emergency continued until 1990, when it was lifted by State President F. W. de Klerk. Apartheid developed by racism of colonial factors and due to South Africa's unique industrialization. The policies of industrialization led to segregation of and classing of people, which was specifically developed to nurture early industries such as mining and capitalist culture. Cheap labor was the basis of the economy and this was taken from what the state classed as peasant groups and the migrants. Furthermore, Philip Bonner highlights the contradictory economic effects as the economy did not have a manufacturing sector, therefore promoting short-term profitability but limiting labor productivity and the size of local markets. This also led to its collapse as Clark's emphasis is the economy could not provide and compete with foreign rivals as they failed to master cheap labor and complex chemistry. The contradictions in the traditionally capitalist economy of the apartheid state led to considerable debate about racial policy and division and conflicts in the central state. To a large extent the political ideology of apartheid had emerged from the colonization of Africa by European powers which institutionalized racial discrimination and exercised a paternal philosophy of civilizing inferior natives. Some scholars have argued that this can be reflected in Afrikaner Calvinism, with its parallel traditions of racialism, for example, as early as 1933 the Executive Council of the Broderbond formulated a recommendation for mass segregation. External Western influence can be seen as one of the factors that arguably greatly influenced political ideology, particularly due to the influences of colonization. South Africa in particular is argued to be an unreconstructed example of Western civilization twisted by racism. However, Western influence also helped end apartheid. Once the power of the Soviet Union declined along with its communist influence, Western nations felt apartheid could no longer be tolerated and spoke out, encouraging a move towards democracy and self-determination. In the 1960s, South Africa experienced economic growth second only to that of Japan. Trade with Western countries grew, and investment from the United States, France and Britain poured in. In 1974, resistance to apartheid was encouraged by Portugal's withdrawal from Mozambique and Angola, after the 1974 Carnation Revolution. South African troops withdrew from Angola in early 1976, failing to prevent the MPLA from gaining power there, and black students in South Africa celebrated. The Malabatini Declaration of Faith, signed by Mangasuthu Buthalizi and Harry Swartz in 1974, enshrined the principles of peaceful transition of power and equality for all. Its purpose was to provide a blueprint for South Africa by consent and racial peace in a multiracial society, stressing opportunity for all, consultation, the federal concept, and a bill of rights. It caused a split in the United Party that ultimately realigned opposition politics in South Africa, with the formation of the Progressive Federal Party in 1977. It was the first of such agreements by acknowledged black and white political leaders in South Africa. In 1978, the defense minister of the NP, Peter Willem Bota, became prime minister. Bota's white regime was worried about the Soviet Union helping revolutionaries in South Africa, 
and the economy had slowed down. The new government noted that it was spending too much money trying to maintain the segregated homelands that had been created for blacks and the homelands were proving to be uneconomical. Nor was maintaining blacks as a third class working well. The labor of blacks remained vital to the economy, and illegal black labor unions were flourishing. Many blacks remained too poor to make much of a contribution to the economy through their purchasing power a euro although they were more than 70% of the population. Bota's regime was afraid that an antidote was needed to prevent the blacks from being attracted to communism. In July 1979, the Nigerian government claimed that the Shell BP Petroleum Development Company of Nigeria Limited was selling Nigerian oil to South Africa, although there was little evidence or commercial logic for such sales. The alleged sanctions breaking was used to justify the seizure of some of BP's assets in Nigeria including their stake in SPDC, although it appears the real reasons were economic nationalism and domestic politics ahead of the Nigerian elections. Many South Africans attended schools in Nigeria, and Nelson Mandela several times acknowledged the role of Nigeria in the struggle against apartheid. In the 1980s, the anti-apartheid movements in the United States and Europe were gaining support for boycotts against South Africa for the withdrawal of U.S. firms from South Africa and for the release of Mandela. South Africa was becoming an outlaw in the world community of nations. Investing in South Africa by Americans and others was coming to an end and an active policy of disinvestment ensued. In the early 1980s, Bota's National Party government started to recognize the inevitability of the need to reform apartheid. Early reforms were driven by a combination of internal violence, international condemnation, changes within the National Party's constituency, and changing demographics a Euro whites constituted only 16% of the total population, in comparison to 20% 50 years earlier. In 1983, a new constitution was passed implementing what was called the Tricameral Parliament, giving coloreds and Indians voting rights and parliamentary representation in separate houses a Euro the House of Assembly for Whites, the House of Representatives for coloreds and the House of Delegates for Indians. Each house handled laws pertaining to its racial group's own affairs, including health, education, and other community issues. All laws relating to general affairs were handled by a cabinet made up of representatives from all three houses. However, the White Chamber had a large majority on this cabinet, ensuring that effective control of the country remained in white hands. Blacks, although making up the majority of the population, were excluded from representation, they remained nominal citizens of their homelands. The first tricameral elections were largely boycotted by colored and Indian voters, amid widespread rioting. Concerned over the popularity of Mandela, Bota denounced him as an arch-Marxist committed to violent revolution, but to appease black opinion and nurture Mandela as a benevolent leader of blacks, the government moved him from Robben Island to Polesmoor Prison in a rural area just outside Cape Town where prison life was easier. The government allowed Mandela more visitors, including visits and interviews by foreigners, to let the world know that he was being treated well. Black homelands were declared nation-states and pass laws were abolished. Black labor unions were legitimized, the government recognized the right of blacks to live in urban areas permanently and gave blacks property rights there. Interest was expressed in rescinding the law against interracial marriage and also rescinding the law against sex between the races, which was under ridicule abroad. The spending for black schools increased, to one-seventh of what was spent per white child, up from on one-sixteenth in 1968. <laughs>
At the same time, attention was given to strengthening the effectiveness of the police apparatus. In January 1985, Bota addressed the government's House of Assembly and stated that the government was willing to release Mandela on condition that Mandela pledge opposition to acts of violence to further political objectives. Mandela's reply was read in public by his daughter Zinzi A. Euro his first words distributed publicly since his sentence to prison 21 years before. Mandela described violence as the responsibility of the apartheid regime and said that with democracy there would be no need for violence. The crowd listening to the reading of his speech erupted in cheers and chants. This response helped to further elevate Mandela's status in the eyes of those, both internationally and domestically, who opposed apartheid. Between 1986 and 1988, some petty apartheid laws were repealed. Bota told white South Africans to adapt or die and twice he wavered on the eve of what were billed as Rubicon announcements of substantial reforms, although on both occasions he backed away from substantial changes. Ironically, these reforms served only to trigger intensified political violence through the remainder of the 80s as more communities and political groups across the country joined the resistance movement. Bota's government stopped short of substantial reforms, such as lifting the ban on the ANC, PAC and SACP and other liberation organizations, releasing political prisoners or repealing the foundation laws of Grand Apartheid. The government's stance was that they would not contemplate negotiating until those organizations renounced violence. By 1987, South Africa's economy was growing at one of the lowest rates in the world, and the ban on South African participation in international sporting events was frustrating many whites in South Africa. Examples of African states with black leaders and white minorities existed in Kenya and Zimbabwe. Whispers of South Africa one day having a black president sent more hardline whites into rightist parties. Mandela was moved to a four-bedroom house of his own, with a swimming pool and shaded by fir trees, on a prison farm just outside Cape Town. He had an unpublicized meeting with Bota. Bota impressed Mandela by walking forward, extending his hand and pouring Mandela's tea. The two had a friendly discussion, with Mandela comparing the African National Congress's rebellion with that of the Afrikaner Rebellion and talking about everyone being brothers. A number of clandestine meetings were held between the ANC in exile and various sectors of the internal struggle such as women and educationalists. More overtly, a group of white intellectuals met the ANC in Senegal for talks. Early in 1989, Bota suffered a stroke, he was prevailed upon to resign in February 1989. He was succeeded as president later that year by F.W. de Klerk. Despite his initial reputation as a conservative, de Klerk moved decisively towards negotiations to end the political stalemate in the country. In his opening address to Parliament on February 2, 1990, de Klerk announced that he would repeal discriminatory laws and lift the 30-year ban on leading anti-apartheid groups such as the African National Congress, the Pan-Africanist Congress, the South African Communist Party and the United Democratic Front. The Land Act was brought to an end. De Klerk also made his first public commitment to release Nelson Mandela, to return to press freedom and to suspend the death penalty. Media restrictions were lifted and political prisoners not guilty of common law crimes were released. On February 11, 1990, Nelson Mandela was released from Victor Verster prison after more than 27 years of confinement. <laughs>
having been instructed by the UN Security Council to end its long-standing involvement in southwest Africa-Namibia, and in the face of military stalemate in southern Angola, and an escalation in the size and cost of the combat with the Cubans, the Angolans, and SWAPO forces and the growing cost of the border war, South Africa negotiated a change of control. Namibia became independent on March 21, 1990. Apartheid was dismantled in a series of negotiations from 1990 to 1991, culminating in a transitional period which resulted in the country's 1994 general elections, the first in South Africa held with universal suffrage. In 1990 negotiations were earnestly begun, with two meetings between the government and the ANC. The purpose of the negotiations was to pave the way for talks towards a peaceful transition towards majority rule. These meetings were successful in laying down the preconditions for negotiations, despite the considerable tensions still abounding within the country. Apartheid legislation was abolished in 1991. At the first meeting, the NP and ANC discussed the conditions for negotiations to begin. The meeting was held at Groot Schur, the president's official residence. They released the Groot Schur minute, which said that before negotiations commenced political prisoners would be freed and all exiles allowed to return. Contrition There were fears that the change of power would be violent. To avoid this, it was essential that a peaceful resolution between all parties be reached. In December 1991, the Convention for a Democratic South Africa began negotiations on the formation of a multiracial transitional government and a new constitution extending political rights to all groups. CODESA adopted a declaration of intent and committed itself to an undivided South Africa. Reforms and negotiations to end apartheid led to a backlash among the right-wing white opposition, leading to the Conservative Party winning a number of by-elections against NP candidates. De Klerk responded by calling a whites-only referendum in March 1992 to decide whether negotiations should continue. A 68-percenter majority gave its support and the victory instilled in de Klerk and the government a lot more confidence, giving the NP a stronger position in negotiations. When negotiations resumed in May 1992, under the tag of CODESA II, stronger demands were made. The ANC and the government could not reach a compromise on how power should be shared during the transition to democracy. The NP wanted to retain a strong position in a transitional government, and the power to change decisions made by parliament. Persistent violence added to the tension during the negotiations. This was due mostly to the intense rivalry between the Nkatha Freedom Party and the ANC and the eruption of some traditional tribal and local rivalries between the Zulu and Kosa historical tribal affinities especially in the southern natal provinces. Although Mandela and Buthalizi met to settle their differences, they could not stem the violence. One of the worst cases of ANCIFP violence was the Boipatong massacre of June 17, 1992, when 200 IFP militants attacked the Gauteng township of Boipatong, killing 45. Witnesses said that the men had arrived in police vehicles, supporting claims that elements within the police and army contributed to the ongoing violence. Subsequent judicial inquiries found the evidence of the witnesses to be unreliable or discredited, and that there was no evidence of national party or police involvement in the massacre. When de Klerk visited the scene of the incident he was initially warmly welcomed, but he was suddenly confronted by a crowd of protesters brandishing stones and placards. The motorcade sped from the scene as police tried to hold back the crowd. Shots were fired by the police, 
and the PAC stated that three of its supporters had been gunned down. Nonetheless, the Boipatong massacre offered the ANC a pretext to engage in brinkmanship. Mandela argued that de Klerk, as head of state, was responsible for bringing an end to the bloodshed. He also accused the South African police of inciting the ANCIFP violence. This formed the basis for ANC's withdrawal from the negotiations and the Codesa Forum broke down completely at this stage. The Bisho massacre on September 7, 1992 brought matters to a head. The Siske Defense Force killed 29 people and injured 200 when they opened fire on ANC marchers demanding the reincorporation of the Siske homeland into South Africa. In the aftermath, Mandela and de Klerk agreed to meet to find ways to end the spiraling violence. This led to a resumption of negotiations. Right-wing violence also added to the hostilities of this period. The assassination of Chris Hani on April 10, 1993 threatened to plunge the country into chaos. Hani the popular general secretary of the South African Communist Party, was assassinated in 1993 in Don Park in Johannesburg by Janusz Walua, an anti-communist Polish refugee who had close links to the white nationalist Afrikaner Weir Stans Bewijing. Hani enjoyed widespread support beyond his constituency in the SACP and ANC and had been recognized as a potential successor to Mandela, his death brought forth protests throughout the country and across the international community, but ultimately proved a turning point, after which the main parties pushed for a settlement with increased determination. On June 25, 1993, the AWB used an armored vehicle to crash through the doors of the Kempton Park World Trade Center where talks were still going ahead under the negotiating council, though this did not derail the process. In addition to the continuing black-on-black -black violence, there were a number of attacks on white civilians by the PAC's military wing, the Azanian People's Liberation Army. The PAC was hoping to strengthen their standing by attracting the support of the angry, impatient youth. In this St. James Church massacre on July 25, 1993, members of the APLA opened fire in a church in Cape Town, killing 11 members of the congregation and wounding 58. In 1993 de Klerk and Mandela were jointly awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for their work for the peaceful termination of the apartheid regime, and for laying the foundations for a new democratic South Africa. Violence persisted right up to the 1994 elections. Lucas Mangope, leader of the Boputaswana homeland, declared that it would not take part in the elections. It had been decided that, once the temporary constitution had come into effect, the homelands would be incorporated into South Africa, but Mangope did not want this to happen. There were strong protests against his decision, leading to a coup d'a copyright tat in Boputaswana on March 10 that deposed Mangope, despite the intervention of white right-wingers hoping to maintain him in power. Three AWB militants were killed during this intervention, and harrowing images were shown on national television and in newspapers across the world. Two days before the elections, a car bomb exploded in Johannesburg, killing nine. The day before the elections, another one went off, injuring 13. At midnight on 26 a Euro 27 April 1994 the old flag was lowered, and the old national anthem Die Stem was sung, followed by the raising of the new rainbow flag and singing of the other CO official anthem, Ngo Si Cycle I Africa.
The election was held on April 27, 1994 and went off peacefully throughout the country as 20 million South Africans cast their votes. There was some difficulty in organizing the voting in rural areas, but people waited patiently for many hours to vote amidst a palpable feeling of goodwill. An extra day was added to give everyone the chance. International observers agreed that the elections were free and fair. The European Union's report on the election compiled at the end of May 1994, published two years after the election, criticized the Independent Electoral Commission's lack of preparedness for the polls, the shortages of voting materials at many voting stations, and the absence of effective safeguards against fraud in the counting process. In particular, it expressed disquiet that no international observers had been allowed to be present at the crucial stage of the count when party representatives negotiated over disputed ballots. This meant that both the electorate and the world were simply left to guess at the way the final result was achieved. The ANC won 62.65% of the vote, less than the 66.7% that would have allowed it to rewrite the Constitution. 252 of the 400 seats went to members of the African National Congress. The NP captured most of the white and colored votes and became the official opposition party. As well as deciding the national government, the election decided the provincial governments, and the ANC won in seven of the nine provinces, with the NP winning in the Western Cape and the IFP in KwaZulu-Natal. On May 10, 1994, Mandela was sworn in as South Africa's president. The government of national unity was established, its cabinet made up of 12 ANC representatives, six from the NP, and three from the IFP. Thabo Mbiki and de Klerk were made deputy presidents. The anniversary of the elections, April 27, is celebrated as a public holiday known as Freedom Day. The following individuals, who had previously supported apartheid, made public apologies.